So welcome to our fall multi-faith workshops uh, series. And um, we're all very glad to have you here. Um, this uh, series of workshops, if this is your first one, is our third one. Um, so for the past uh, three years, we have been uh, working together as a team, the Renaissance Institute of Ministry, Studies in Islam, and our partners from the local Jewish congregations. So um, it's been a wonderful experience. Um, the last two, we first year focused on issues of um, faith and feminine, and last year we did a series on mysticism in all three traditions. And this year, based on the feedback that we received from our attendees, the focus is on understanding pilgrimage and sacred space uh, from the three Abrahamic traditions. A um, little bit about um, Renaissance Institute of Ministry and Studies in Islam. Uh, Renaissance Institute of Ministry offers Christian theological education in the form of non-credit courses, workshops, and special events designed to nurture thirsty spirits, hearts, and minds. The Institute's events connect people with experiences to help them deepen their spiritual journey with God, understand their neighbors of different faiths, serve the world as a disciple, lay minister or deacon, flourish in a community of learners and teachers. Studies in Islam is an academic program of the University of Waterloo that is based right here um, at Renison. Uh, we offer a minor in an interdisciplinary studies program called Studies in Islam. And we have students that come from a variety of disciplines who take our courses. Um, the series has three parts. And uh, today we are going to focus on introduction to pilgrimage from um, and listen to three different perspectives, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. The next two uh, will be Sunday, November the 15th, and that one will be uh, focused on places of pilgrimage. And the third one will be December the 13th, um, and the focus will be on stories and experiences of uh, pilgrimage and pilgrims. So a little bit about um, the format today. We will um, go with the chronological order of the faiths. So we'll have our Jewish, Christian, and Muslim speakers uh, go respectively. And uh, they will each speak for 25 minutes. After that, uh, we will take a five minute uh, prayerful reflection, reflecting on what we have heard. And um, we will also take a break, a 15 minute break. Uh, this process, this whole um, workshop series is less um, you know, lecture oriented, it's more dialogic in nature. So certainly we welcome everyone's participation and that is the spirit of this uh, workshop series. So you will have a chance to participate with the presenters as well as participate amongst yourself in small groups. So we'll, after we come back from the break, um, there will be a dialogue among panel presenters followed by small dialogue groups in which all of you will participate, and then we'll have a larger dialogue. Uh, we'll start now and hopefully finish on time by 5 o'clock. And our timekeeper is Marilyn Mal Malton, my dear colleague and friend, without whom none of these workshops would happen. So thank you, Mar uh, Marilyn. And my other partner here is Daniel Maus, who has been a wonderful partner in this creation of this workshop series. So thanks to both of them for their cooperation and help. And so it's a team effort. Um, I'll read through bios of all three speakers so I don't come back here to disturb anyone. So our first speaker um, who will be reflecting on the Jewish uh, perspectives will be uh, Dr. Daniel Maus. Uh, Daniel is a research associate with the Department of Religion, Concordia University, Montreal, and an instructor of Christian and Jewish studies at Waterloo Lutheran Seminary, Wilfrid Laurier University. He has authored and edited several volumes on Christian and Jewish topics, and is a certified teacher of scriptural reasoning, which involves interfaith dialogue within the three Abrahamic faiths, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And we run a scriptural reasoning group here at Renison of which Daryl and Daniel are an important part. Daniel was raised in southern Ontario by a God-fearing mother and an atheist father. 
learning of his mother's Jewish roots and claiming his own Jewish birthright while spending a sabbatical year at Hebrew University in Jerusalem in 1996 to 1997. Daniel is married to a devout Christian and intimately understands both the benefits and challenges that interfaith relationships bring. He has worked as a field supervisor at archaeological sites in the Galilee, uncovering material evidences of the Davidic kingdom, and has also led many study tours to the Holy Land for Christians to appreciate their historical roots. The topic of pilgrimage is both personal and prof of professional interest to Daniel. Next to Daniel, Dr. Darrell Bryant uh, is a distinguished professor emeritus in religious studies and director of the Center for Dialogue and Spirituality in the world's religions, both at Renison University College, where he began teaching in 1973. He has authored many volumes in the study of religion and has long been deeply involved in interfaith uh, dialogue and dialogue of religions. Ever since his childhood on the plains of Dakota near Native American Reservation, Darrell has been keen to know more about his own Christian faith and faith of others. That passion has continued and deepened through his studies and through many opportunities to meet people of different faiths in their own settings. For example, in ashrams, temples, masajids, and gurdwaras in India, in Buddhist monasteries in Korea, Sri Lanka, and Japan, and in masajids in Egypt and Turkey. And next to Daryl is um, Dr. Amir al-Azraqi. Amir <coughs> received his BA in English from the University of Basra, his MA in English Literature from Baghdad University, and his PhD in Theater Studies from York University in Toronto, Canada. During the first years of the Iraq War, 2003 to 2006, Ali Az um, Amir, <laughs> uh, in addition to teaching English drama at the University of Basra, worked as a fixer and translator for various international news outlets, such as the Dallas Morning News, later wor working for Al Mirbad TV and radio run by the BBC World Service Trust. He taught modern English drama at York University, and he's um, finished his dissertation on representation of political violence in contemporary plays about Iraq. He's currently teaching English and Arabic right here at University of Waterloo. And he's also a performer and playwright. And among his plays are Waiting for Gilgamesh, Scenes from Iraq, Stuck, Notorious Women, Lysistrata in Iraq, The Widow, and Judgment Day. Please welcome all the distinguished speakers. Before I leave here, just a note as to how we have designed these workshops. Um, we do our best to keep, as I mentioned earlier, dialogue as the heart of these gatherings. And um, each gathering will emphasize respect for the variations within each faith tradition and encourage discussion. Uh, we hope that you will experience an inviting space in which you'll hear the perspectives and experiences of others and to share your own. The three presentations will provide a starting point for conversation, and it is our hope that you will listen attentively to each other, appreciate differing points of view, give freely of your own experiences, and also confine our discussion only to today's topic. Thank you and welcome. This afternoon, I am tasked to provide a brief historical overview of pilgrims and pilgrimage from Jewish perspectives throughout Jewish history which, to avoid anachronism, includes the two earlier stages included in the story of the Hebrew people and the biblical accounts of the Israelites. In defining what I mean by the word pilgrimage in this short talk, I have researched several familiar sources and adopted their meaning and application to understand pilgrimage as it concerns Jews and Judaism. Uh, we don't, in contemporary times, have the concept of pilgrimage such as we did in ancient times, as we'll find. I would like to acknowledge at the outset of this presentation that there are differing historical narratives which compete with each other, not only concerning details of the stories themselves, but also concerning ontological representation, geographical location, and historical time framing of events. The perspective I give here is a traditional Jewish one that acknowledges but does not include details of competing narratives. 
I will try to be sensitive to how I present this perspective in as non-offensive as possible a manner relating to competing narratives of which I am aware. The commonly held definition of pilgrimage as given by the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary indicates one, a journey to a holy place, and two, a journey to a special or unusual place. Four simple sentences are given to contextualize these definitions. The first two refer to religious context, while the last two consider a secular application. He made a pilgrimage to Mecca. The tradition of pilgrimage is important in Islam. The family went on a pilgrimage to historical battlefields. The poet's grave site has become a place of pilgrimage. As these examples show us, the concrete concept of pilgrimage is, like many terms commonly in use today, largely interpretive and even limited to the era in which we live. I'd like to demonstrate this by drawing examples from three different time periods in history, the ancient world, the Middle Ages, and our modern, postmodern era. First, if I were a Jew living in what we sometimes refer to as the ancient world, during the first or second temple periods of history, I would have a clear biblical mandate to travel to Jerusalem or have a representative of my Jewish community do so three times a year because historically Judaism had three biblically-based pilgrimage festivals, Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot. Passover was a pilgrimage festival which recalls the days when the Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt and liberated through the leadership of Moses, as described in Exodus chapter 12. Prompted by God to address Pharaoh on behalf of his people, Moses interceded with warnings of plagues that would come upon Egypt should Pharaoh fail to heed Moses' appeal to let my people go. Each would come upon Egypt, and each time Moses addressed Pharaoh, he would agree to release the Hebrew people from their captivity only to change his mind and suffer increasingly frightful plagues. All the water in Egypt, whether in rivers or in jars and basins, would turn into blood. Frogs would cover the land. The dust of the land would turn into lice. Flies would fill the air. Disease would affect all Egypt's livestock. Boils would break out on all flesh of all living beings and terrifying hail would descend on the entire land and foliage, foliage devouring locusts would become so numerous that the land could no longer be seen. And three consecutive days of thick darkness through which nothing could be seen would come upon them. But on Moses' tenth appeal, with the death of the firstborn throughout the land of Egypt as the stated consequence of failure to follow through with the promise to let the Hebrew people go, God's angel of death would visit each home except for those who followed a command given by God that would be a sign for the angel of death to pass over. Pass over these dwelling places, places without killing any inhabitants within. It was the Hebrew people alone who sprinkled blood on the lintel of their doorposts, thus averting judgment through God's promise, when I see the blood, I will pass over. And so annually, the streets of Jerusalem were crowded with pilgrims and community representatives from all over the world, beginning on the 14th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, called Pesach in Hebrew, translated Passover, and lasting eight days. A second pilgrimage festival followed one month after Pesach on the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Tishri in the Jewish calendar. This second pilgrimage festival was commanded in Leviticus chapter 23. Sukkot recalls the temporary tents, booths, or tabernacles the Hebrew people set up, slept in, packed up, and wandered with once they escaped Pharaoh's land and dwelt in the wilderness for the next 40 years. This seven-day festival required living in temporary structures reminiscent of the provisional dwellings during the wilderness wanderings. Also referred to as the Festival of Our Rejoicing, Sukkot, or the, Fe the Feast of Tabernacles, further developed into a harvest festival sometimes called the Festival of Ingathering, 
celebrating the gathering of crops from the fields. Hebrew prophets who spoke of a future day in which an anointed deliverer would come to rescue the Hebrew people from their earthly struggles indicated that this Messiah would appear during the festival of booths or Sukkot, as read in Zechariah 14. During temple times, the streets of Jerusalem were filled with makeshift booths wherein pilgrims from all Jewish communities throughout the world dwelt for one week. A third pilgrimage festival, also counted from Pesach, beginning 50 days after Passover on the sixth day of the Hebrew month of Sivan, the festival of Pentecost or Shavuot in Hebrew, Jewish tradition teaches that on the 50th day following the night in which the angel of death passed over the homes of the Hebrew people, they received the Torah from God through Moses at Mount Sinai. Shavuot then is a day of celebration, remembering the faithfulness of God to deliver God's people from the boundless freedom of the desert, wherein they certainly would perish a celebration of the giving of boundaries called mitzvot or commandments that would provide the limits of the walk that God required for all faithful Jews to follow. Once again, Jerusalem was teeming with pilgrims during the celebratory festival of Shavuot. But these festival pilgrimage, pilgrimages ended 1944 years ago in 70 of the Common Era when Roman forces destroyed the Temple in Jerusalem, a time when Jews were subsequently driven from their homes and largely relocated outside the Land of Promise. After this, only a few Jews lived in very small and scattered communities in the lands formerly called Judea, earlier known as the Southern Kingdom, and Israel, earlier known as the Northern Kingdom. As the Hebrew scriptures obligated Jews to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem during these three times each calendar year, and given that Jesus and his disciples were Jews, we should not be surprised that the Christian New Testament, especially the Gospel accounts, bear testimony to each of these pilgrimage festivals. For example, Jesus was crucified during the Passover season when the city of Jerusalem was filled with Jewish pilgrims outside the, from outside the Holy Land, Matthew 27. Earlier in that same Gospel, chapter 17, the transfiguration of Jesus took place on Mount Tabor in the presence of James, Peter, and John, at which time Peter offered to build three Sukkot, one for Jesus and two others for Moses and Elijah, who appeared as witnesses with the transfigured Christ, because Peter estimated that Jesus was the Messiah who would come during Sukkot, as predicted by the Hebrew prophets. And apparently for Peter, it didn't matter what time of the year it actually was. Finally, according to the author of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, the church was inaugurated during the Feast of Pentecost, when Jews from throughout the world were in Jerusalem to fulfill their obligation of this pilgrimage festival. Thus, Christianity recognizes each of these holy days in its ecclesiastical rituals and liturgies, albeit in modified terms and expressions. Second, if I were a medieval diaspora Jew, that is, a Jew living anywhere in the world except Israel during the Middle Ages, I would be permitted to visit the land of promise only on one day of the calendar year, the day designated by Jewish authorities as the Day of Lamentation, also called Tisha B'Av, which is the Hebrew calendar date of the ninth day of the month of, when Jews traditionally lament the destruction of the temple structure that was twice built and twice destroyed, once by the Babylonians in 586 before the Common Era, and again in 70 of the Common Era by the Romans. According to Jewish records, both destructions occurred on the very same calendar day of the year, the ninth of Av. So, as a medieval diaspora Jew, I'm not permitted to move back to what is now regional Palestina because the Roman Empire that ended Temple Judaism also banned Jews from living in Jerusalem and until recent history, Jews were banned from making pilgrimage to Jerusalem except on Tisha B'Av, which Jews did. The picture this created is simply portrayed, albeit with difficulty, explained. 
the remnants of a large lower wall on the western side of the great courtyard built by King Herod in the first century were all that remained of the second temple structure built by Ezra and Nehemiah in the Persian era. It was at these ruins that Jews were allowed to return to pray in Jerusalem on the Day of Lamentation. As a result, this towering western wall became dubbed the Wailing Wall, or in French, Le Mur de Lamentation, because Jews who made the pilgrimage would stand before the, rich, the ruined temple wall and weep, praying for a restoration of fortunes, being under obligation by tradition to lament on this very day the destruction of the Jerusalem temple before whose ruins they stood and, imp and implored God to restore God's promises of the past took place. Even today, people refer to this wall as the Wailing Wall, though Jews who are sensitive to the history of naming this wall as such defer to calling the site by the Hebrew directional designation Kotel, Western, and in English refer to it as the Western Wall or the Kotel. For Jews unaware of or insensitive to pejorative aspects of the common reference to the Kotel, there is no offense in hearing others refer to this location as the Wailing Wall, and many liberally minded Jews today also refer to the Kotel as the Wailing Wall. Third, as a Jew living anywhere in the world today, we can visit Jerusalem because of historical events that occurred in 1948 that led to the establishment of the State of Israel. For some Jews, both religious and secular, merely visiting Israel in general, or Jerusalem in particular, is a pilgrimage. For many other Jews, it is not viewed as such. There are, however, a number of other travels that may qualify as pilgrimages for religious and secular Jews in the modern and postmodern world. As we will hear details about this in the next two sessions from Bob Chodas and from Diana Park, I will only provide a skeletal historical review or, or overview uh, this afternoon of this third aspect. So I'll step back and uh, instead talk about, for example, uh, the Ministry of Tourism of Israel provides what's called familiarization tours. Familiarization tours are established uh, and heavily uh, sponsored by the Ministry of Tourism for Jews who have never been to the land of Israel. Uh, they can go, they can go for eight days, they can have uh, their trip largely subsidized by the State of Israel, and they can visit the various sites. They can do a religious or they can do a secular visit of the State of Israel. And if they do the religious, it will take them to uh, places like the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron. It'll take them to Rachel's tomb on the road from uh, Jerusalem to uh, Bethlehem. It'll take them up to Tiberias around the uh, lake. There are all kinds of cemeteries with famous rabbis from the past uh, who have died and who have uh, a various, uh, various religious uh, connotations for uh, modern uh, Hebrew prayers. Um, these familiarization tours are also available for uh, people of other faiths who are particularly involved in some form of ministry. Um, the State of Israel offers an eight-day tour in which, uh, for example, pastors or Sunday school teachers or people who have adult Bible classes as Christians um, can go if they've never been to Israel before and can have a religious tour of the various sites where Jesus and his disciples um, moved and uh, taught and had uh, their various activities up in the Galilee in the Jerusalem area uh, with some uh, more secular visits to the Red Sea and to the Dead Sea uh, thrown in on top of it. I have uh, had the uh, benefit of leading about a dozen of these familiarization tours uh, with Christians who have never been to Israel before uh, to the tune of about 120 or 130 uh, Christians over these uh, dozen uh, different tours. And each time uh, they come back with a renewed appreciation of their own faith uh, and also an understanding of the uh, complications of uh, living in that land, whether you're living in that land as a person from the first century or uh, obviously today. A second uh, form of pilgrimage 
may be seen uh, through a friend of mine, Archie Burkle, a former cantor of Beth Israel Congregation in Winnipeg, who travels to different uh, sites throughout the uh, world where there used to be a Jewish uh, presence, a Jewish community that no longer exists. And so what he does is he travels, uh, for example, to uh, North Africa countries, cities in North Africa where there was a Jewish presence, and he documents uh, cemetery inscriptions, and he gathers as much material as possible. Then he'll travel to Eastern Europe where there are various uh, former shtetls that no longer exist. And he again documents uh, through pictures and uh, copying of inscription and uh, digitizes all of this material. And for him, it's a particular pilgrimage and he has an online site that people can go to and understand and give him feedback as to where he needs to go next. And he has initiated a whole uh, stream of people who are interested in going to these places and seeing these things as well, and has created sort of a sub-pilgrimage uh, uh, tradition, I suppose. As we would find in uh, many different religions, sacred tombs provide for pilgrimage sites. I mentioned Rachel's tomb, I mentioned the Tomb of the Patriarchs. Uh, one in particular is of interest because, uh, especially around uh, the uh, Tiberias Lake or the Sea of Galilee, which it's also called. Um, it's, uh, that lake is dotted with burial sites of Jewish sages, making it one of Israel's holiest uh, cities, the city of Tiberias. Pilgrims flock to the tombs of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Meir Baal uh, Hanes, and uh, the tomb of the great philosopher and sage Maimonides. With Maimonides, um, many come to his grave to pray for livelihood, uh, to pray for a partner, uh, to pray for even fertility. And so we have in uh, Maimonides' tomb, because he was a medical doctor, he was a philosopher, he was a great, great Talmudic thinker and uh, made uh, amazing contributions to what we now understand as uh, modern Judaism. Um, Maimonides' site, gravesite is of particular interest to pilgrims. But I'd like to focus uh, just for a minute on an example, Rabbi Meir, whose nickname is Baal Hanes, which means miracle worker, um, which comes from a Talmudic story, this story describing how uh, Rabbi Meir uh, saved his sister-in-law from the clutches of the Romans by a combination of subterfuge and uttering a single prayer. God of Meir, he said, answer me. And so Jews have been coming to Rabbi Meir's tomb at least since the 13th century, and over the years, a blue dome building has been constructed over his gravesite located near Tiberias. And there are also hot springs there, which are, of course, famous for their curative powers. And this becomes a special place to pray for healing as well as for divine intervention. Uh, so we have that as an example, but uh, each of the grave sites and each of the major rabbis who are buried there have a particular um, power that is understood by some, uh, and therefore it becomes a place of pilgrimage for people who are of more religious uh, inclination. A friend who is at Concordia University, Barbara Weiser, has made a life study of architecture and art in synagogues that were formerly, buildings that were former synagogues, and now they are in secondary or tertiary use as uh, often Christian churches are community centers. Um, she has uh, made a study of the architecture and comparing and contrasting that architecture with more uh, current uh, synagogue structures, as well as the art and the uh, stained glass work of these uh, sites because a as what happens in uh, secondary and tertiary use, often these things eventually uh, become removed and uh, we lose them. So she's made her website, uh, the website of a pilgrimage for the art and architecture of secondary and tertiary uh, former Jewish structures, particularly the synagogues. And uh, then there are uh, disappearing shtetls that I referred to before, especially uh, post-Holocaust Eastern European uh, towns and communities uh, where a Jewish presence no longer exists. 
our own uh, Wendy Weinberg, uh, Holocaust education representative for the Waterloo Region District School Board, former vice principal, and uh, she's with the Equity and Inclusive Advisory, Inclusion Advisory Committee. Uh, Wendy has made her life study uh, to travel to these former shtetls and to gather as much material uh, and documented. And uh, so Wendy will be possibly here uh, in uh, one of the next two sessions, and we should be able to hear from her on that. And then finally, and uh, finally, uh, there is a March of the Living. And a March of the Living is a high school project for students who uh, are taken to Poland and who are brought to the, uh, the uh, concentration camp of Auschwitz. And there's an entire program. Diana Park, who is going to be speaking to us in the third session in December, will address this. So I'm just going to mention that it is another uh, very active and very uh, engaging uh, pilgrimage uh, program that exists within uh, the modern and postmodern Judaism today. With that, um, the imagination alone allows us to think of what other ways in which Jews define and create pilgrimages simply by doing something, uh, finding something of particular uh, sacredness if they're religious or of historical import if they're, sac if they're secular, and then passing it on to others and it, and it catches on like wildfire and the next thing you know with a website, uh, they've created another stream of uh, potential pilgrimage. So we don't have technically pilgrimages today. We don't uh, follow those three pilgrimage festivals like uh, in, in, in the ancient world, but we do have these modern representations. Thank you. Uh, pilgrimage, the Christian way, and I want to begin with a story, an imagined story. As the medieval pilgrim made her way together with a host of other pilgrims along the roads that wandered through the fields of the French countryside in the late summer of 1225, she fell on her knees as an astonishing sight came into view. It was the recently completed Chart Cathedral, and it seemed to be floating in the air. As she continued her walk, it became clear that it stood on a hill with its towers reaching towards the heavens, and around her base was the town of Chart. The lines of the cathedral were clean and clear and light. It was hard to believe it was made of stone. The flying buttresses were like lace supporting its vast structure. As she made her way through the narrow streets of Chart, past shops and homes built right to the edge of the street, townspeople were going about their daily business in the shadow of the great cathedral. It was said to house a tunic that had been worn by the Blessed Virgin, Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was to Mary that Madeline would make her prayers as she did daily in her life in the village near Orléans, a two-day walk away. Chartres had been an important pilgrimage site even before the new cathedral had been built, not as important as the Camino de Santiago in far-off Spain, but still important. Around the cathedral was a vast market and nearby the cathedral school. As she entered the cathedral through the west door, she marveled at the carved arch with its statuary reflecting the medieval world. Christ at its apex, below him the apostles, saints, and ecclesiastical leaders, the philosophers, and all the stations of the medieval feudal world. Inside the stained glass windows cast a rainbow hue over the vast space, and on the floor, a labyrinth wound its way towards the high altar. It was a holy place. Pilgrimage is a practice found across uh, the religious, uh, across the world religions. Primal, Hindu, Brahmanical, Vishnavite, Shaivite, Chinese, Confucian, Taoist, Abrahamic, 
Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, Buddhist, Sikh, Jain, and newer religions. All of these traditions have the practice of pilgrimage, even if not all the Jewish community in the modern world, they have known this phenomenon throughout their history. Pilgrimage comes from the Latin peregrinus, meaning foreign, which is derived from perege, meaning going abroad literally through the field. And a pilgrim is someone on a journey. A journey to a sacred space for a spiritual purpose. It is found within the Christian traditions, and it's found and experienced differently within the different Christian traditions. As you all know, that within Christianity, we have three major streams uh, of religious life, the Catholic, the Orthodox, and the Protestant. And in the Protestant traditions, there's a kind of suspicion of pilgrimage that we don't find either in the Catholic or in the Orthodox traditions. Pilgrimage is the way of the pilgrim, is the journey to a sacred site and to a holy place. It can be a place like the Black Hills for the Lakota Sioux, or Gangotri, the headwaters of the Ganga River, high in the Himalayas a place like the hills of Galilee where a founding figure like Jesus once walked, or it can be a place like Bodh Gaya where Siddhartha Gautama experienced his awakening. Sacred places are places of, communi of communion between the divine and the human, or places of power where human life might be transformed, or places that reflect or embody the sacred order of the divine, or they can be all three. For Christians, Jerusalem was from the very beginning a place of pilgrimage, and it was followed in importance by Rome, which later became a place of pilgrimage, primarily because Rome was the site where both Peter and Paul were martyred. The third place that becomes a very important pilgrimage site is Santiago de Compostela in Spain. To give you just a very short history of pilgrimage within the Christian tradition, Origen, at the end of the second century of the Christian era, spoke of going in search of the traces of Jesus, the disciples, and the prophets. Things changed when Christianity became legal in 313. For the first 300 years of the Christ Christianity, Christianity was an outlaw religion. Helena, the mother of the emperor Constantine, is said to have discovered the site of the true cross when she journeyed to uh, Jerusalem. She ordered the building of the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem and the Church on the Mount of Olives. Constantine, then the emperor, ordered the building of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem after 325. Jerusalem, the Holy Land, and Rome became important pilgrimage sites. The earliest pilgrimage text that we have comes from the year 335 in the Common Era, and it's by the Pilgrim of Bordeaux. In the seventh century, Jerusalem came under the governance of the Muslims. In the 800s, the relics of James, the son of Zebedee, the disciple, were found in Galatia in northern Spain, and by the 1100s it had become a major pilgrimage site known as Santiago de Compostela. The first crusade in 1095 was initiated by Pope Urban II, and it was a call for a pilgrimage and a holy war against the infidels to recover the Holy Land. 
So this is where our term, holy war, comes from. It comes from the Christian tradition, and it's about sort of uh, recovering the Holy Land from the Muslim tradition. And interestingly enough, too, the um, Santiago de Compostela and uh, James, the uh, son of Zebedee, he's also known as James the Moor Slayer. And there was a conflictual element to the founding of this, uh, this pilgrimage site in Santiago de Compostela. Pilgrimage becomes central to medieval Christianity, and uh, we will give much more attention to that in a few moments. And uh, things begin to change for pilgrimage in the Christian world with the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, but it didn't mean uh, in any respect the end of this pilgrimage tradition because uh, early on that tradition came to the new world as we called uh, this world on this side of the Atlantic and uh, is represented in uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is uh, actually the third most visited uh, pilgrimage site in the world. Uh, more than uh, 20 million people visit the shrine of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe just outside of Mexico City. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what happened to pilgrimage in the modern world in relation to Marian shrines and the contemporary revival of pilgrimage. My own first experience of uh, pilgrimage happened in relation to Assisi. I grew up in the Lutheran tradition that was rather suspicious of things like pilgrimage. It smacked of works righteousness, Lutherans would say. And even when I began my study of theology at the Harvard Divinity School, I don't remember ever having pilgrimage as a major theme. It was something that came for me later. My first pilgrimage experience occurred more or less by accident. I was in Assisi, the hometown of St. Francis, when a throng of people began walking through the streets on their way down to the Basilica of Santa Maria Angeli in the valley below Assisi. We joined them, uh, walking with them uh, the two miles down, to the, down the valley. It was done in silence, and uh, there were some people carrying placards that indicated they had come or had walked all the way from Germany from Switzerland, from Northern Europe, and we got in on the last uh, two miles of the journey. And when we got down into the valley, we crowded into the basilica that had been built there, and inside there's a smaller, little tiny chapel that's often regarded as the founding place of the Franciscan movement that's inside the basilica, and you can see it at that, and that picture on the, uh, on the left side of the screen. It, uh, <clears throat> and a short service unfolded, and then everything, and then the pilgrimage was over. When we went back to Assisi, I learned to my surprise that I had received a plenary indulgence for my participation in the pilgrimage. And it always kind of amused me as I thought that pilgrimages ended with Luther's uh, uh, criticism of that uh, practice in the 15th century. The real um, heyday of pilgrimage is in the Middle Ages, the medieval pilgrimage. The goal of the pilgrimage is a visual and actual tactile contact 
with a sacred relic. That's how it was understood in the Middle Ages. And that's why Santiago de Compostela is such an important example uh, of, uh, of pilgrimage. Um, the story is that James, one of the early disciples, one of, one of the 12 disciples, had left Palestine or uh, that part of the world and had gone as far as Spain and preached the gospel to the Spanish. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a sort of a, a legend that, we, that emerges fairly early in the Christian era. And then he returns to uh, Spain, or uh, to Palestine, sorry, and when he's back in Palestine, he is martyred, and he's beheaded, and he's buried um, in Palestine. And then about uh, in the 800s, his tomb is rediscovered on the coast of North Spain. And that becomes the, the relic then that is encapsulated in the cathedral in Santiago de Compostela and begins the pilgrimage tradition in relation to that site. Now, I think it's interesting when we think about uh, medieval pilgrimage to look at this list of motivations uh, was found in a, in a, in a classic uh, text. Remission of sins, gratefulness, devotion to St. James, prayer to fulfill a vow, to the recovery of physical well-being, either for oneself or for others, the hope of a miracle, or an opportunity for a great adventure. And when pilgrimages took place in the Middle Ages, they typically lasted six to nine months. So you are really devoting a significant period of, of your life to going on a pilgrimage. And it was something that was largely, unless you were of royalty, done on foot. In the Hindu tradition, the word for pilgrimage is someone walking, uh, walking towards a de destination. And when I think of pilgrimage, I always think of the two pilgrims that I met at a great Hindu pilgrimage site called the Kumbha Mela in India that happens once every 12 years. And I've been three times to the Kumbha Mela. And in 2013, there were 30 million other pilgrims there for that event. It's the largest gathering of human beings that ever takes place on our planet. And I always remember the first pilgrims that I met in the, in, at the Kumbha Mela. They had spent a week walking from their village, would stay for a week at the Kumbha Mela, which is an event that goes on over 28 days, and then they would spend another week walking back to their village. And they always, for me, typify the, the real pilgrim. It was no easy adventure. A, medi a medieval pilgrimage along the Camino took six to nine months. It was dangerous, physically challenging, and yet very, very popular. And there's the church at the end of the Camino, the Santiago de Compostela, and modern pilgrims walking the Camino. This is, I think, a very interesting quote that I came across uh, concerning a society of pilgrims, a floating population living for as long as the pilgrimage lasted on the margins of society escaping its rules by their very mobility and relative blending of the component social layers. It ran headlong against a medieval 
fixed ordering, and societal segmentation. That's a learned way of saying that pilgrimage was a popular action that frightened ecclesiastical authorities because it wasn't really under their control. And I think it's interesting to see this popular aspect of, uh, of the development uh, of pilgrimage within the Christian uh, traditions. And in the case of Santiago de Compostela, you see the sort of elements of both faith and superstition that are intertwined with one another about the site and its purposes and what is gained through uh, the pilgrimage to uh, that place. Now, <clears throat> we say the numbers are down, but I think it's very, very interesting that in a uh, place like the Compostela de Santiago, that there are still 150,000 people, I wouldn't say pilgrims, but 150,000 people who make that trip to along the Camino every year. And that's really a kind of revival, sure. So, uh, <clears throat> Marilyn, tell me to uh, hurry up, and uh, I will. <laughs> and I'll just uh, make a few quick comments about, uh, there's another a wonderful book about a pilgrimage, and that's uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. There are stories of pilgrims on their way to Canterbury in England. There's another Russian classic called The Way of a Pilgrim. And this, one, this particular text really uh, explores the difference between uh, the outer and the inner aspect of the journey that one is going on. The pilgrim, here the pilgrimage is wholly within the life of the pilgrim as he inscribes this phrase, Lord have mercy on me, on his heart, and integrates it with his breath. So it's not a story about going from one place to another, though there's a lot of going in the story. It's really a story about integrating this fundamental uh, teaching on his heart and breath so that with every intake and every inhale and exhale, you repeat this phrase. And what's interesting in the book is that the story tells us about what the impact of this uh, practice was upon his life as he came to feel more loving towards all of the people that he encountered on his way. Um, just a, a very brief comment about Our Lady of Guadalupe, as I said earlier, it's the most visited Marian shrine in the world with 20 million people a year visiting this shrine. And in Fatima uh, in 1917, this is a modern uh, pilgrimage. And you would think after the, both the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, that there would be so many social forces that are working against uh, pilgrimage and yet uh, some of the largest uh, shrines in the world and places of pilgrimage have occurred in the modern world, including the one at uh, Fatima, where in 1917, three Portuguese children had a vision of Our Lady, and in 1930, the Vatican declared them worthy of belief. And I think that says something, too, about how these are initiated by events and experiences in the life of Christians that then the church, after a long period of time, comes to say yea and nay. And I wanted, and I will just say this uh, very briefly, much of my experience of pilgrimage has been in relation to other traditions than those of Christianity. Uh, and I and, and 
I think one of the interesting things that's happening in the contemporary world in terms of pilgrimage is that you not only have people from a specific religious tradition engaging in pilgrimage, but people from the secular world who are engaged in pilgrimage, and people from one tradition participating in the pilgrimage life of other traditions. And certainly that has been uh, my experience, and it's been one that has greatly uh, enriched my life. And I'll end with that. And that's myself, my son, uh, my son-in-law, and my daughter at the Kumbh Mela in 2013. And I welcome your questions later. Thank you very much. Muslims are divided into uh, the, the majority are the Sunnis, and the minority, they are called Shia Muslim. I'm talking today about the Shia Muslim and the rituals called ziyara. Um, I have to uh, also clarify about the terminology here when I am going to use it. Um, Ashura, which is also a holiday uh, observed on the 10th of Muharram, the first month of Islamic year. And the word Ashura means 10, uh, Ashra, donating the date of the holiday. And uh, it commemorates the death of Hussein, the grandson of Muhammad, and uh, which uh, who was killed in Karbala, place Karbala in Iraq, in the 1680 BC. Rituals, um, uh, basically public expressions of mourning and grief. Some Shia express mourning by flagellating themselves on the back uh, with chain beating their heads, or ritual uh, that includes cutting themselves. This is intended to connect them with, the, um, with Hussein's suffering and death. Um, ziyara, the, the topic of today, is one of these rituals. Other rituals include tazia, majlis, and shabih, which is a theatrical enactment of the death of Hussein, similar but not identical to the Christian passion play. Uh, Ashura ceremonies uh, could be simply seen as a performance because I look at them uh, from a, a theatrical point of view. Um, I'm, original, um, I'm not originally like a Muslim scholar, but I, uh, I look at uh, the rituals from a theatrical point of view, especially ziyara, the topic of today. Um, so they are a performance consisting of dialogue, di uh, audience, actors, cons costumes, and props. And these rituals take place specific times, specific place, uh, like uh, the rituals have various purposes and function. It is believed that performance of these rituals transform the actor, the pilgrim, from ordinary mundane world to a world of holiness and religiosity. These rites, these rites may politically galvanize the pilgrims and uh, the people involved, especially in Iraq, uh, which is uh, the place of the shrine. The, the ziyara. So what is ziyara? Ziyara comes from the verb zara in Arabic, which means to visit. A Shia Muslim ritual, which means a visitation of pilgrims to the holy shrines. Um, each year, thousands of Shia Muslims come from all over the world to visit the shrine, to march in massive parades. Some of the pilgrims walk for days to visit Hussein's shrine in Karbala. Shia Muslims have many occasions to visit the shrine. They usually visit, uh, visit the shrines, each birth and death of one of their 12 imams. Uh, the focus here is on the visitation uh, of Imam Hussein, um, which is the grandson of Muhammad, the occasion of his martyrdom. The reason why I'm focusing here because of its considerable political and religious cont controversial significance. I just want to show you um, how they march towards the shrine every year. In, uh, uh, Muharram month. Um, they walk for days, and uh, some of them uh, barefoot. Uh, come uh, like takes some of them actually more than 15 days, like a month or more. Um, theatricality of the ritual, including performance. So uh, pilgrims uh, perform uh, repetitive body gestures and religious chants. They usually be their, beat their heads and, and chest while shouting the name of Hussein or Ali. Ali is the cousin of Muhammad and also the father of 
Hussein, who is the grandson of Muhammad. I just want to show you um, how they do that in, uh, in the shrine. This is in the shrine, inside the shrine. So they uh, perform certain body gestures, celebrating the death of uh, Hussein. Uh, so. Um, the other, the other things that they do while visiting the shrine as pilgrims, um, they do uh, what is called tatbir in Arabic, which is theatrical self-flagellation, plugging their heads with swords, as, in, as you see here. Um, and zanjil, which is also theatrical self-flagellation, plugging their shoulders and heads with chains, as they see here in the... Um, Uh, it takes, uh, takes place at a specific time and place. Uh, takes place in specific time, 10th of Muharram, and the place is Karbala, uh, which is in Iraq. Audience, we have three types of audience. Uh, pilgrims who gather at the shrine uh, to visit and who perform specific theatrical rituals. We have people, uh, the local people of the city itself, and uh, we have the media, the people like journalists and all of the TV uh, journalists or newspaper journalists, etc. Um, dialogue, we have uh, some, some of the pilgrims are formed into two or three courses, like as you, s as you saw in the video, uh, to exchange glorifying morning religious chants using rhythmic tone with music, drums, and poetry. Um, uh, the, the motivations of uh, uh, pilgrims is so somehow similar to the Christian ones, actually, especially the first, the second one. Um, forgiveness of sins, but for the Shia Muslim, they believe that ziyara, which is uh, visiting the shrine, is equal to Hajj. Hajj is the main pilgrimage for Muslim, uh, uh, is equal to Hajj, Umrah, and Jihad. In fact, ziyara is far superior to these actions. Some of them, they believe it's more important than Hajj itself. And they found all these uh, motivations in a sacred book called uh, by Ibn Kilaway. It's called The Merits and Methods of Visiting Holy Tombs. So um, one of the motivation, for example, is the, uh, the forgiveness of sins, the cause for a quick and easy accounting in the Judgment Day, um, and all of these. You see a lot of them. Actually, I listed them. Um, Um, the politics of this ritual, which I also am interested in, politics of Ziyara in Iraq in particular, uh, this kind of ritual could be easily politicized, not only in Iraq also, but in Lebanon, in, in Iran, and uh, in many places where they practice this kind of ritual. Um, history, uh, the formation of the Sunni monarchy in 1921 was a clear challenge for the Shia. Both the British and the Sunni government sought to reduce the power of the clergy by eradicate, eradicating the effectiveness of Muharram uh, and Ashura rituals as a political instrument. Both the British and the monarchy ex exercised kinds of pressures on the practice of Ashura and Ziyara rituals. In Saddam's time, Shia were considered a threat to his regime. Ziyara was seen as a provocation strategy for resistance. After, uh, after the fall of, of Saddam's regime, these rituals uh, uh, have been used in demonstrations, riots against the new Iraqi government, the occupation, and other political issues. My point here is that Ashura rituals have been clearly politicized after the fall of Saddam. Even some of the big Shia political <coughs> and religious leaders have begun to make use of these rituals for their political propaganda and agenda. Ashura, uh, Ziyara, I mean, and, and the Passion Play, some similarities. The rituals of Shabih and Ziyara could have some uh, common elements with certain Christian rituals like the Passion Play and the body flagellation, uh, they call it the mortification of the flesh, of certain Christian believers 
who is earliest documented process took place in the 13th century in Italy. These, be these believed that by flagellating their bodies, they repented not only their sins, but also the sins of the church and the entire clergy. Likewise, the rituals of self-flagellation as the core of the Shia piety who think of self-sacrifice and bloodshedding as a purification of guilt. Um, also, other, <coughs> other similarities between uh, the, uh, the Ziyara, Ashura in general, and the Passion Play. Both, <laughs> both Jesus and Hussein are seen as martyred for redemption, and both are perceived as med mediator between God and the people. The Passion Play centers on Jesus and his supporters. Ashura ritual centers on Hussein and his, and his clan. Jesus is betrayed by those who are initially loyal to him, while Hussein is betrayed by their once loyal Kuf Kufans. The Christian play is devoted to the passions of Jesus, meaning his suffering and gruesome death, just as Ashura rituals are devoted to the tragic suffering and the death of Hussein and his family. A significant part of both stories deal with the grieving as well as the courage of women, whether of Mary, who mourns the loss of her son, or Zainab, and Zainab is the uh, Hussein's, uh, sist uh, Hussein's sister, who uh, lives to tell the story of her brother martyrdom. Jesus is not portrayed as powerful avenger, rather he's seen as a, a suffering servant of God who allowed him to be sacrificed to atone for the sins of all the world. Uh, as Michael Fisher says, similarly suggests that Hussein had to witness for Islam and thereby shock people back to the true path to serve as an example throughout the ages that sometimes death can create a lasting testament that people will remember. The last point I want to, uh, the last one I want to mention here is uh, there is a connection between terrorism and ziyara. Um, if we look as uh, foreign viewers on the practices of these rituals, how they use violence, graphic images, to create a spectacle which is very violent and graphic spectacle as you've seen, uh, the bloody spectacle. Um, it, uh, for the foreign viewers, could produce terror effect. Ironically, um, these people, I mean those people who practice these rituals, targeted by s extremist Sunni groups in Iraq, like car bombs and suicide bombers. And those, of course, use extreme violence, extreme graphic images, and they also produce terror among the uh, pilgrims and also uh, for uh, other viewers of the same rituals. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm going to begin with a question uh, to, to Daniel. Actually, two, two, two questions. One of the things you mentioned is that you do tours for Christians. I used to, uh, used to yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've been in Israel only, only once and okay. did my own yes. little tour. Yeah. And uh, a Catholic uh, who it turned out had gone to St. Michael's, uh, mm -hmm. where I went to school too, okay. yes. that was now ran the center at Tantru. Ah, uh, yes. Uh -huh. And he characterized uh, the difference between Catholics and Protestants who come to Israel as Catholics come on pilgrimage. Protestants come to find out if the Bible is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does that? Yeah. fit at all with your experience of showing um, So my experience, yeah, my experience was with uh, sometimes Catholics, sometimes Protestants of denominations, sometimes Protestants of independent churches, <clears throat> and a few times with atheists who slid in under the uh, radar mm -hmm. um, as friends of people who had uh, a faith community that was sponsoring the trip. <coughs> What I particularly found was that uh, the people who were of the Catholic faith were not shocked by the holy sites that had such embellishment and uh, the colors and all of the different uh, paraphernalia that goes with these uh, holy uh, cathedrals, the, the churches of the Holy Sepulchre and of the Nativity and so on. Um, I've I just so many times heard uh, Protestant uh, pilgrims or tourists say that it's so gaudy they just can't imagine anybody seeing anything of faith or having their faith encouraged. Mm -hmm. And the Catholics would 
just see it as a springboard to devotion and faith that they already had. Um, I never, I never heard, uh, I never heard the, the question of is it true, but uh, more than once I heard a variety of interpretations come from the same group. And, and so there was a willingness to have what I would call polyperspectivity, you know, and, and see from a number of different interpretive starting points and presuppositions different conclusions, and they were perfectly fine with that. So maybe that's a little bit of the same. I, the other question I wanted to ask you, when, when I visited, we went to a, to a place in northern Israel mm -hmm. that had been established after 1492, when the Jews were expelled from mm -hmm. Spain, and where there had been an important kind of Jewish there had been three rabbis that had come there. It starts with S.A. Safir, Safir, or no, oh, the place oh, of the town. Sfat. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. And A mystical town, actually. Yes. yes. Right. Could yeah. you say something about that? Because you oh, talked about, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the Jews being there until seventy, and then mm -hmm. not being back right. until forty-eight. Yeah. You had yeah. That. Well, <laughs> sure, and. I don't mean that there wasn't a continuous presence, Jewish presence, uh, you know, from the dispersion of the second, literally um, in the second Jewish revolt of 132 to 135, uh, that was pretty much it for large Jewish communities in the land. But um, Jews were still coming. It just was, there wasn't wholesale immigration to, or Aliyah going up to Israel because as soon as it became a, a, a measurable or an identifiable movement, it was stopped by whoever happened to be controlling the immigration uh, policies. So uh, the thing about Sfat is it's, and, and I learned this uh, when I was a university student. A um, friend of mine was a student in philosophy at the University of Michigan. And I used to hitchhike over to Michigan to take her philosophy classes um, just for fun. And um, she was really into Edgar Cayce, uh, you know, and, and so she convinced me that in various parts of the world there are uh, centers of spirituality, centers of spiritual power. And uh, in a different way, though I think in a similar way as well, Sfat is viewed as one of these uh, dynamic centers of spiritual power. And so people who are uh, mystically inclined, mm -hmm. uh, and there was a, a whole revival of mysticism after Maimonides uh, introduced Aristotelian rationalism to Judaism, and that became the norm a generation and a half after Maimonides. It wasn't accepted in his day. Um, the, the pendulum swing, which eliminated mysticism with this rationalism, swung back, and then you had the age of Kabbalah, the age of Jewish mysticism, and that was when people started looking for these centers of spirituality. And you can stop an individual rationally from going someplace that's dangerous or forbidden, but it's really hard to stop a mystic, <laughs> you know, if they've got it in their heart. And so people just found ways of getting there. Uh -huh. and, and I suppose uh, there's something a little less intimidating if people are going with a spiritual agenda than with a political agenda. So I don't know the history of the uh, community in Sfat. I do know, however, that um, it pr is probably the exception to the rule uh, of there being uh, movement uh, to and from mm -hmm. uh, Israel, but, but not Jerusalem mm -hmm. uh, in the medieval period. That's, that's all I can say about it, except that I've been there and I still, I keep going there but I haven't yet uh, felt the dynamic that I wanted to look for, so with apologies to the mystics. <laughs> the, uh, it, I thought it was really important that you raise this question of the interface between certain kinds of ritual activities and politics and how politicized they can become, because I think that's, a, that's an issue in relation to all of our uh, traditions, you know, how they get caught in other kinds of agendas, uh, as I think happened for, uh, in relation to uh, 
Santiago de Compostela, that conflict with, uh, I mean, we're talking about a period in Spain's history where you had in Andalusia this wonderful cooperation between Jews, Muslims, and Christians. And then up in another part of Spain, you've got the emergence of this anti-Muslim and you enlist, you enlist St. James uh, on your side. He becomes the Moore Slayer. And uh, so I, I think that was a really important issue. And do, do Muslims see the, that happening? Uh, in Iraq or outside? Yeah, yeah in Iraq. In Iraq, yeah, they start to be aware of politicizing the rituals mm -hmm. uh, for the, those who are in the government, the current government. So they start to be aware of this. But for some times, like since the fall of the regime, uh, they've been uh, practicing these rituals and very passionate, especially when someone like a political figure appears during the rituals and uh, do the rituals with them and uh, you know just to win it's like voting uh, vote for me because i'm with, from you i'm supporting your rituals i'm you know what i mean it's uh, so they politicize but in the past these rituals were used to uh, go against the current regime the sunni regime uh -huh. mm. So I, if I may, I have a question for you too, yeah. Amir. Um, so I already asked uh, during the break uh, if there is a, an equivalency of this um, self-flagellation and, and this uh, self-emulation yeah. uh, that is in Shia. Is there an equivalency in Sunni? Uh, and, and I know, I think you said not at all. No, I didn't say not at all. Okay. I, uh -huh. um, as far as I know, yeah. There is not, like, not a flagellation in the right. literal sense. They have another, this is in Iraq, we call them darawish, darwish. Okay. They do a kind of a show, which is a theater, a theatrical show, yeah. um, where they show you that they, uh, by the power of God and their belief in God, mm -hmm. they can, for example, insert a sword. In the, and you can't see anything, no blood, no nothing. So they do this show, but uh, they pronounce the word of God many times. It's mm -hmm. just very like, ritualistic performance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they do very like supernatural actions for the viewers. They, we don't see blood, but really like yeah. stuff happening. Here. Do we know how they do that? <laughs> uh, for me, I didn't know. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I don't know yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah, but this is yeah. in Iraq. I don't know yeah. about, uh, yeah. maybe Idrissa can answer this question because I have no... Uh, Not to my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, for example, in some parts of India, they walk on live coal. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. And um, whereas in other parts of India, it's a celebration, a very similar to a Hindu celebration of drumming and dance. So it's very interesting. Uh -huh. It has taken a variety of cultural contexts. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it's a time of remembrance. Uh -huh. And uh, certainly none of that we would see in the Sunni world uh -huh. at all. Uh, where I come from, for example, um, the Sunnis would be the silent spectators, but at the same time, tending to those who are self-flagellating and involved in the procession by making food for them, mm -hmm. providing helping them, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting, <coughs> interesting time, uh, but it has also been politically uh, motivated and colored yeah. in other parts of the world as well. <coughs> and, and as a follow-up. Uh, you triggered a thought, a question I had earlier, but it, it, it escaped me. That is, you've both mentioned that it's with minority groups that these practices are largely done. Is there an example of um, a majority uh, Shia group that practices these things? Or is there such a thing as a majority Shia? No, no, it's, the majority. it's a majority it's the now. Major it's the majority now. Yeah, because uh, during, yeah. I'm talking about Iraq, for not Iran. Right. Iran, the majority right. are the Shia. Bahrain, right. the majority is Shia. Right. But the Iraq, because this, the, this, the government, Saddam's government, and before the monarchy was the Sunni government. Yeah, right. So uh, the, these practices were not allowed to okay. happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a few of them, and not like to this extreme. 
Right. Um, yeah, because they were aware of their, uh, could be politicized sure. against them. So that's, yeah. yeah. Right. But they are the majority, the Shia, the majority in Iraq only. And in Iran, do in they Iraq, practice Iran, this? In Iraq, Iran, Bahrain. Zero as well? Uh, in Iran, do they? Yeah, the, they the Shia yeah. majority yeah. in Iran. Well, Exactly, in they Iran. They evolved from Iran. Yes. Oh, yeah. So when the Safavids came into power, so you had this first Shia majority government coming in. Supported by. They instituted these rituals. So there was none of this in the Shia world. At exactly. All until then. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it has a very political history and background to it. Mm. And, and a question for Daryl, if I may as well. Um, so you have experienced these pilgrimages and these phenomena. Um, sometimes engaging in, in uh, very mirac miraculous uh, phenomena. And with respect to Christianity, which is a younger experience historically, would you see a borrowing from these earlier traditions or would you see it as some kind of a contemporaneous or uh, simultaneous phenomenon that just happens among different peoples when they get religious? Yeah. Um, Great question and uh, no easy answer to that, but what immediately comes to mind is the Our Lady of Guadalupe and uh, Jean uh, Diego, who was the uh, convert to Christianity, is out praying on a hill where he has this, uh, he senses the presence of, uh, of a young woman. Now. The hill on which this happened is the same hill that in the Aztec tradition, there was a feminine goddess that was worshiped, okay? And so this is where Mary appears to him. And he speaks, and she speaks to him in his language, asking him to build a church. Right, and so there, there, there is this kind of interesting kind of coming together of traditions in this in this way that, you know, when I read some of the stuff about uh, that uh, uh, event, uh, it does uh, acknowledge that this was an Aztec site. But then it goes on to describe the Aztecs as these people who practice human sacrifice and so on and so forth. And so it was kind of a good thing that Mary came to that site and so on and so forth. And, and it's, it's so interesting. I mean, you, we have this discussion because we know how through, uh, throughout much of Christian history, uh, we have Christianity constantly not acknowledging its rootedness within the Jewish tradition. And, you know, even in the Gospel of John, when you talk about the Jews, it sounds like there are these other people, and then there's Jesus and his disciples. Well, who are they? They're Jews, right? So and, and, and equally, we have this tradition of not talking about Jesus, one of us, <laughs> in, in our history, too. Right. Sure, yeah. Right. yeah. But, but it's so interesting how strong this impulse is to make our own tradition absolutely unique. And it, it sort of descends from the heavens. It never rises up from the earth. And it never seems to be influenced by those other groups that are around, whereas when you look historically, it's so clear that they have been, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so syncretism becomes a dirty word rather than a, a <laughs> sort of it's something we should, we should acknowledge the gifts that have come to us from other traditions, right? And during the break, I was mentioning, Gadaro, that it's, it's a rare occasion when I can find an Orthodox rabbi who will agree that there is Greek thought syncretism in Jewish Orthodox tradition. Yeah. It's pure, uh, you know, and, and it's reinforcing that. Sure. That's a huge problem in, in all of our traditions. Yeah. How can common pilgrimage places be shared? The first thing I thought of was 
probably one of the most difficult pilgrimage places to be shared, and that is uh, the, uh, depends on, and we have nomenclature, whether it's Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, for uh, what Jews would call the Temple Mount area, which uh, is where the Dome of the Rock is, where Christians uh, get together as uh, along the Via Dolorosa and the Way of the Cross, and, and I would have to sit down uh, you know, with an awful lot of reflective energy to come up with anything viable that would satisfy myself for how we could get everybody to share that space because historically we're still trying to figure it out. It's so politically charged. As Amir pointed out, you know, these, as soon as politics uh, gets its claws, uh, it doesn't let go. And so you've got to now deal with the situation that might otherwise be complicated enough, but then now you have to deal with these talents that won't let go and they have nothing to do with uh, our goal. So I, I apologize for starting on a negative note, but uh, it, it's probably the, the thing that came to my mind the most. I, yeah. Anyway. Jerusalem, it, actually, even more specifically, the, the rock on which uh, one of Abraham's sons is traditionally said to be offered. You know, I, I, I think we miss the opportunities that are really so available to us. And it reminds me of when I first went to India how welcoming the different communities were to my coming and being a part of their uh, services, to be a part of their experience, you know, welcomed into their places of worship. And one of the things that I've done for 30 years uh, teaching here is in a course on the study of religion, I simply take people to the local Gurdwara, to the local temple, to the local mosque, to the local church, whatever. And uh, I would say that simple thing is worth uh, at least uh, a month of my lectures, right? And probably much more than that. That there's something magic about just simply meeting the people of the other traditions in their place of worship where they gather for a spiritual purpose. You know, and I love it that you get together over coffee. And I, I, I want to, uh, and I feel too that we somehow make this thing of dialogue seem so, is this something that academics do or who, who does this? No, it's a very simple thing. It's about meeting our neighbors, right? And we don't have to go to the other ends of the world to do that. All of those world religious traditions are right here in our own community. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so we, our group actually spent quite a bit of time talking about this. The, question. The, the question is, what is the question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so the Abrahamic roots of the three traditions. And uh, with our scriptural reasoning text discussion group that has been meeting for about three years now and uh, on a monthly basis, uh, generally speaking, um, with at least two, uh, sometimes three Jews, Christians, and Muslims, uh, in uh, present dialogue, uh, and we've you know moved from the unfamiliar to the familiar to the uh, over familiar at times, and it's just delightful that when we focused on the person of Abraham, we started with this idea of common text, common ground, common word, and we ended up deciding that Abraham has a different face for each of us, has the same name but a, a different focus, a different um, role in each of our traditions. And uh, my way of homogenizing things uh, in order to 
live with uh, these differences is that when I look in the mirror, psychologists tell me that there are five different faces that I can see of myself at any given look in the mirror. And so it doesn't surprise me that Abraham would have these many uh, different uh, views as well, or faces as well. All the five continents, basically. <laughs> sure, why not, yeah. Yeah, I know that one of, uh, one of the great uh, sort of experiences in, in, in my life was a conference that I was at in Turkey and it was held in Haran, which is a place that Abraham left to go south, right? And it was, uh, it, and it was called the Children of Abraham and so we had Jews, Christians and Muslims and uh, it was one evening where uh, I had a Jew sitting on one side of me and a, a Muslim sitting, sitting on the other side, and we had this conversation about Abraham. And I was like, I've been waiting, I, I mean, I felt like this is what I've been waiting for my whole life. And it was just remarkable. And did we have a problem talking? No, you know? And we somehow, you know, I know this for myself, grew up with this idea that there are these big walls that separated all of these different religious communities. And my, my life uh, experience is they're little tiny steps away from one another. And it's just having that courage to cross that little <laughs> tiny boundary that's mostly in our own imagination. And, you know, extend a hand to the other and all kinds of wonderful things happen. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'll start with the next question. I mean, so, uh, uh, pilgrimage can appeal to Christian young people. Is this true of all three faiths? So say that again, sorry. If pilgrimage appeals to younger people in, in the faith tradition, so yeah. does it Uh, pilgrimage, uh, if it is appealing to young people in Islam. Uh, as you know, Idrisa Hajj is not uh, appealing for the young uh, Hajj, which is the main pilgrimage uh, in uh, Islam. Uh, it's not appeal, uh, doesn't appeal to the young as much as it appeals to the um, older generation. Uh, but for the other uh, minor Hajj, we call it Ziyara in the Shia, for the Shia Muslim, yes, it appeals for everyone. Even you can see children, mm -hmm. you can see women in different ages and different, yeah. But for Hajj. You should say for Hajj because yeah. now I see um, young people. Countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, Iran and other places, um, they go to Hajj for honeymoon. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. I mean, it's traditionally, yeah, traditionally it's for the, um, uh, we have this tradition, if you are old, you have to go to Hajj, it's time to go to Hajj, and, and yeah, but uh, there are, yes, yeah, but there are always exceptions, and you see young people in Hajj, but generally speaking, it's for older generation. Because they can afford it now, and I see a lot of North American young yeah, and also you can see young people who uh, come to Hajj to help their parents, the old parents. Mm -hmm. They carry them, they do that, so it's part of their Hajj as well. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think there's a lot of interest among younger people. I mean, not, is it across the board? Probably not, but uh, I, I guess in my experience, I've been surprised, you know, when I, with what I want to do, take people to India. Uh, I never have any trouble uh, finding uh, willing participants, right? And it's just, uh, I mean, uh, I guess the, the biggest thing is, uh, is, is trying to, well, I think we have this idea that young people aren't really interested in religion or they aren't really interested in spirituality and so on and so forth. And I just don't think that's true. No. Yeah, I think it's a matter of uh, sort of opening that question with them and 
we find that there's a lot more interest there than we imagined. Yeah. The um, session that we'll hear uh, in December with Diana Parks deals with the March of the Living. And that's a program that is highly subsidized and it's a very uh, Western and North American, um, though it's March of the Living International, um, I'm, I'm only able to speak about the North American aspect of it. And uh, because it's so highly subsidized and it gives an opportunity for high school students between certain ages to go to Eastern Europe, uh, to go to um, a concentration camp to actually experience what they have learned mm -hmm. about recent history um, is extremely popular. Uh, and you don't often hear about young people saying, I'm going to be busy that summer. Um, they actually participate. And, but there's another uh, pilgrimage that I failed to mention earlier, but Bob will talk about next uh, session, and that's the um, birthright program. And so all young Jews in North America have a birthright trip, highly, again, highly subsidized, uh, to go to Israel to touch base with the homeland, if you would. Um, it's, you know, ET Call Home program. And uh, it truly does have a high participation rate in North America. I don't know as in Europe it would be as subsidized. I just don't know the subsidies there. But again, I can speak from the North America that those are two programs I know of. The other kinds of pilgrimages we talked about, I don't think so, you know. But then you get that from their parents as well. So there isn't that same interest necessarily. Um, I may have Good question. For you, um, if uh, Ziara is considered by some Shia equal to Hajj, why would they go for Hajj and some Hajj month? And uh, she gives reference mm. uh, of a friend who was very keen on going to the uh, pilgrimage and you know, considered it a great blessing. You know, they, they, that most of the Shia, they, by equal to Hajj means it's like it, traditionally, it's as important as Hajj, but it doesn't, if you go to Hajj, sorry, if you go to Ziyara, if you do the Ziyara, you still have to go to Hajj. It doesn't matter whether you, yeah, it, because Hajj is compulsory, Ziyara is not. However, if you go to Hajj, uh, Ziyara, uh, you will be rewarded by God, uh, all these things, but it's still you have to go to Hajj because it's one of the five uh, pillars of Islam, uh, in Islam, I mean. You have still, to, you have to go to Hajj, yeah. Thank you. Daniel, what is the motivation of the modern Jewish pilgrim? Um, is there any similarities of a Christian or Muslim tradition? Yeah, so um, uh, we were saying in our group that one of the few stereotypes about Jews and Judaism is you can't stereotype Jews in Judaism. So it's a difficult question to answer because there really isn't a particular pilgrimage that is specific to most Jews um, in almost anywhere in the world. Partly because Jews, uh, emically, like from within, we don't think of Jews as only religious. We think of Jews as um, born Jewish or in few cases converted to Judaism through marriage or something else uh, or because of marriage, not through marriage. Um, and so the idea of uh, Jews are religious is probably 15% true and 85% questionable. Uh, I mean, I tell my students uh, that I'm not religious and they then say, if he's not religious, then I don't know what religion is. But for me, religious is you, you wear the signs, you pray three times a day, you eat kosher all the time, not just do you eat kosher? Yes, and I, I also don't eat kosher. <laughs> I, you know, and you know, do I keep the holy days? Yes, in my own way. You know? and, and so I'm not religious, but, but I, I do a lot of things uh, that Jews do that would be identifiable. And so, you know, but, but that's not... So, so the idea of do Jews practice pilgrimage, 
uh, and what is common, uh, it, it's really not that, it's not a question that, yeah, it's a difficult question to uh, figure out. But it's our fault, not yours. <laughs> The participant uh, feel, most of them feel catharsis, the word, you know, catharsis. Oh, yes. yeah. So the purification of guilt and sins and all of this, so they feel relieved. Mm -hmm. So that's what they feel. I, uh, I don't want to like uh, say a sweeping generalization, but this is what I learned about this kind of ritual. Um, yeah, I, I would say uh, basically they were saying that that when when that's that's a very special situation to find yourself in on on a pilgrimage. You have to realize that it's often said that uh, up until the late nineteenth century, most people in the world never traveled a uh, hundred miles from the place of their birth. So when you, when you engaged in, the, in this pilgrimage, you were really doing something that was very unusual, right? And really put you in a situation where your normal kind of interaction with people was thrown topsy-turvy. You wouldn't, I mean, you were with strangers for one thing, you weren't necessarily just with, the, with people that were familiar to you. Uh, you were going into different land, you crossed uh, borders, all kinds of borders. And um, you know, this was, a, this was an issue for governments, for, for uh, ecclesiastical authorities, for all kinds of people in, a, in authority. So uh, uh, I just, how big a problem was this? I don't know if I could answer it in those terms, but I know that uh, that these were these were matters that caused some concern. Right. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm going to take a moment to look around if anyone has any pressing questions that you would like to ask that have not already been asked. Right. Well, one of the things that has has struck me about the conversation thus far is that in two instances, the identity of faith is indelibly etched in your gene sequence. Hmm. The, the Christian perspective, I would suggest, is, is that where a choice has to be made. Hmm. And I just found that to be striking in, in terms of is that an accurate perception? Let's start A choice to be made uh, exactly which context? Do you really have a choice in terms of your faith identity? If you, uh, if you ask me growing up there, yeah. no, you don't have a choice. Yeah. If you are growing, growing up in a family where you are Catholic, you have to, you, you're going to be a Catholic, right? But there, you, you can't say, I, no, I don't want to believe in this. It's, it's dangerous for you. Mm. Yeah. That's what I'm, mm -hmm. that, like, did I answer the, because I, this is, I'm talking about my situation, yes. that if you, if you have choice, then I would say, okay, I don't want to be a Muslim, I want to be Christian, for example. Mm -hmm. Then you'll be in trouble there. <laughs> yeah. Of course you'll, no, yeah. yeah. But uh, technically, you don't have choice. I, I wouldn't overstate that, that difference because I would say growing up in a, in a, in a particular sort of Christian family, yeah, exactly. you don't uh, exactly yeah, feel like that's a, that's a big yeah, choice absolutely. for you. Uh, you know, we have this uh, 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 ritual of, uh, of confirmation and that's supposed to be the time when you make this decision you know, for yourself and so on and so forth. And, you know, I mean, I, and I went through that. I, would, I was the kind of kid who 
when, from the time I was a little boy, I used to love to sit in the front pew and just uh, mimic the preacher. And I never had trouble with church and so on. I went through my own little kind of rebellions, but they were never very significant when I was a teenager. But I found when I went to the when I went to uh, divinity school, that's when I felt I needed to make a decision of where I stood in relation to this tradition that I'd grown up in. And if I didn't believe it, then I should certainly find my way out of it. But you know, um, that's how it would have uh, how it unfolded for me. My uh, upbringing was not Jewish. Uh, my father was atheist and my mother didn't know she was Jewish. And I found that out um, on one of these archeological trips, um, actually during a sabbatical at Hebrew University um, through doing genealogical studies because a mystical uh, rabbi told me that if I ever checked things out, I'd find out that I had a Jewish neshama or a Jewish soul. So took me a while, I checked it out, and I found out, I don't know whether I have a Jewish soul, but I have a Jewish mother. <laughs> and uh, according to tradition, therefore I have a Jewish soul. But, um, so I was raised fearing God when I was with my mother and denying the existence of God when I was with my father. Um, in terms of choice, um, it, I, I'm remind, you know, I, I apologize for having Christian response to this, but at the end of John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress, um, the, the Christian character is entering the celestial city or the celestial gates, and he sees whosoever will, let him come freely, and he thinks marvelous, and he enters in. Then he thinks, just before I enter into this glory, I look back and get reinforced one more time about my decision that says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you from the foundation. And, and I think a Jewish response of one of many that I have just within me alone uh, is I have a choice to deny my ontology. I have a choice to deny my birthright, but I can't deny that I have that birthright. I don't know what that means. I mean, every day it means something different. It's a kaleidoscope. Thank you. Thank you. Good we question. We talked about purification on the pilgrimages. Mm -hmm. How is that with the Jewish people? Do they have this yeah. idea too that they would like sure. to be purified by okay. uh, pilgrimage to yeah. Jerusalem? And, and so there's that sacred secular yeah. split. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question is, we have talked about purification and with respect to Jewish pilgrimages, which we're putting in quotation marks, um, do the uh, rules of purification apply to Jews who are on uh, these special trips? Um, if, they're, if they're religious, they will be following the purification laws whether they're on a trip or not. And if they're not religious, uh, it wouldn't necessarily occur to them that there's anything impure about their activities or their associations with others. So it, it depends on the person, I would believe, and their community as much as anything else. Uh, in the ancient world, yes, purification was, you have the story in the Gospels about um, to priests that were heading to Jerusalem to do service at the temple, and they came across somebody who had fallen uh, among thieves on the road to Jericho. And they had to keep going because their mandate from God was don't become impure by touching a potential corpse and also be on time. You know, they've got all this. And, and I interpret that text not as those priests that wouldn't be sympathetic but rather, what a compassionate God that knowing that these guys were doing what God asked, God brought somebody else along to help this poor person that was, uh, had fallen among thieves. So it really, for me, shows the compassion of God and the practicality of anybody that's available, God will use. So that, that for me, is the way I would interpret it. But then, of course, 
I'm always looking on how to de-anti-Judaize, uh, you know, yeah. Um, I'm sure all of you would agree that we would like this conversation to keep going. It has been such a wonderful, valuable, and uh, enlightening uh, afternoon. So please, would you all join me to thank all three of you. Thank you.